Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Lifetime Legacy Lawyer podcast. I am Thomas Vick, joined by my co-host, Seth Wilson. Seth, how are you today? Thomas, I am well. Thanks for asking. Glad to have you back safe and sound from your trip and looking forward to another episode of the podcast today. Absolutely. So the blog die just went out today. Uh, and one of the topics that we want to discuss is estate planning for a modern blended family. Uh, this is a uh, certainly a, a, you know, a topic that brings up issues that we see quite often in our estate planning practices. Uh, and so let me just open up the floor to you. What is your approach when you've got a blended family and you need to do some estate planning for them? Yeah, I think first is helping the client recognize the additional considerations that may be in play because of the blended family scenario. So kind of the typical order of operations may be a little bit different. Um, and you may even have different beneficiary schemes that you want to accomplish. So if you do have children from a prior marriage or uh, what have you, that situation requires some additional careful planning and consideration. And so you can do a lot of joint type documentation, but I think what I found is a lot of times it makes sense to treat it almost as individual plans and now your second spouse as an additional beneficiary and, and kind of flip the planning model a little bit on its head, depending on obviously what the goals are. But if you as an individual are concerned or uh, with making sure that your lineage um, passes those items along, then oftentimes that separate trust agreement can be a very good vehicle for accomplishing that. How about you? Yes. So when you got a blended family, uh, sometimes the you know, the husband and the wife have separate bank accounts. They kind of keep everything separate. They might have a prenuptial agreement. Um, and so it's uh, it, instituting, you know, estate plans that kind of continue that setup can be appealing and, and really helpful to the client. So, um, you know, having, you know, a husband's trust uh, that says, you know, this much to the wife and this much to my children and then a wife's uh you know trust that says this much to the husband and this much to the kids that's that's a way to do it um you know sometimes there's a there's a balance between wanting to uh, provide for the surviving spouse but then making sure that the that the your own biological kids receive something from from your estate or from your trust. And so one of the compromises could be that you provide for, you know, income to be paid to the spouse, but then all the principal is to be left in reserve for the for the kids. That's what we call a, a, a Q-tip trust, Qualified Terminable Interest Property Trust. Um, that can be a, a helpful device um, especially if there are some investments that, uh, you know, large investments, the the interest can help the surviving spouse, but then the the kids can feel like, hey, I'm not getting completely left left out to dry here. Yeah, I, I agree with that, and I think it's just again one of those fact sensitive inquiries as to the scenario and the situation, and it's. I'm always amazed at how, in theory, everything should be simple, and we just want to make it even or fair, and we want to make sure that this happens as as easily as it can be with as little burden on my beneficiaries as possible, and and that's great, but I always want to get to where the rubber meets the road in terms of, okay, when we actually go out to move an asset, whether that's a bank account or a vehicle or the car or the house, I mean, then how does that happen? And we have to make sure that we know what the titling of those assets are and how that's actually going to be transitioned. And if there is a goal of transitioning that around someone or allowing someone else to use it for a while and then give it to someone else, 
you, you need some language in your documents to help accomplish that. It's not as simple as I'm just going to let Thomas handle it and he'll be fair about it and, and make sure that happens. I've given you ownership if I do that. And now you've got other complications. And we've talked in the past about some of those gifting issues that come into play if you do those kind of things. So having that plan in place can really help work through each of those scenarios. And, and an attorney will help you walk through and figure out because that's kind of how our brains work a lot of times is that what happens in the worst case scenario and then work right. from there to, to get a plan in place. Yeah. Yeah. All, all good stuff. Well, the next topic is what do I need to know about probate court? Uh, what do you think about that topic? You know, I, I've been thinking a lot about probate and probate avoidance opportunities in your planning. And it, it, probate itself is, it's not usually as bad as someone might make it out to be. I think a lot of times I, I use the analogy of, do you watch the news? Well, do you, you know, what percentage of the news is good news versus what is bad news? And I think that's sort of folks exposure to probate a lot of times is they kind of get the only the bad news and never hear of the 95% of cases that just kind of work through that process um, pretty well. But in general terms, probate is the process by which you ask the court for permission for the personal representative to carry out the terms of the decedent's will. Um, assuming they had a will, if, if there was no will and it's an intestate scenario, that's a little bit different. But then the personal representative has authority to act on behalf of the estate to carry out what the terms of the will contain. And until the court appoints that, the personal representative doesn't really have the authority to do anything, nor do any of the, or the beneficiaries of the will, even though in practical reality, they might think they do and start acting, right, and start dividing some things up. So... Um, that's that's the official court process, and it walks through from the beginning where the personal representative is responsible for figuring out so, sort of what the estate looks like, gathering all of the information and getting it all organized, and then figuring out you know what bills still need to be paid, et cetera, and working through to where they would actually provide an accounting of everything that was done to the court for approval and to all the beneficiaries, and that also has some claims and those kind of things. How about you? How do you explain that process? The way that I explain it is uh, probate is going to the court and asking permission from the judge to be able to settle one's affairs. And, you know, that's not something that seems very pleasant. You know, you don't you don't want a judge in your life if you can avoid it. Right. Uh, and so that's that is why I, you know, encourage folks to avoid probate so that you know, you can at least uh, prevent that one element of complexity from, you know, being part of carrying out your, your final wishes. Um, so it's asking permission from, from the court to settle one's affairs. Um, and then, you know, depending on whether there's a will or not a will, and maybe even what is or is not included in the will, the, the state maybe a supervised administration or an, an unsupervised administration. And if it's supervised, then you have to ask the court over and over again for permission for, you know, selling real estate, selling, you know, items from the estate. Uh, so that that's definitely a reason to avoid having to go through, through probate. Right. So, uh, yeah, it's not terrible. Uh, but it it has the ability to to be pretty complex uh, with you know just depending on what the facts and circumstances of the estate are. I think also when you when you think about getting somebody else involved in sort of that permission based activity, it increases the time, and so the the time involved between getting approval from the court to take action if necessary just getting the documentation prepared to open the estate, getting the signatures of everyone, getting those on file, getting the publications published and putting the world on notice of the passing and those kind of things. It's, it's a very public process. 
right? So that's part of the, the probate situation is everybody has access to that information. And conversely, if you have a trust, you don't have to file the trust with the court at the appropriate time. So again, it's, it's more open to everyone. Most of the time, it's a pretty smooth process, but it does take some time to complete. And so I think more and more with the courts being congested with more and more types of cases and just the sheer number of growth in our counties, especially where we uh, practice a lot of times, there's just a lot more balancing in favor of probate avoidance than subjecting your estate to probate. I th and I always look at that on a kind of a cost basis or a return on investment basis of what's the total cost to the estate going to be and how do you you know balance the scale one way or the other and i'm in my practice i'm just starting to see that scale tip a lot more in favor of probate avoidance than in years past right right uh, all good points all good points so uh this past week you you already kind of alluded to it uh we uh, i i went down to honduras on a, a medical mission trip i uh you know, I'm not a doctor, obviously, and I didn't play one in Honduras. So uh, I, I was one of the, the folks that, that did Bible studies. And, you know, we would go from door to door and just ask people if they wanted to have a Bible study. So uh, that was good. A lot of people down in Honduras are, are willing to sit down and have a have a Bible study with you uh, or just stand in the front yard and, you know, open up the Bible and, and, and talk about it. So that was really, really encouraging. We saw like a thousand people in the in the clinic. They were averaging like two minutes, uh, a, a new patient being registered every two minutes in the wow. in the clinic. So things were moving pretty good. Um, and like I said, a lot of a lot of Bible studies and a lot of good things happening down there. Uh, but on Friday we kind of had like a, a a fun day so we we drove to a huge waterfall it was probably like 500 feet tall maybe and uh we decided it would be a a good idea and very fun if we would all go zip lining on it <laughs> uh and so i went zip lining for the first time in my life and it was uh I, I haven't been that scared since riding a roller coaster for the first time in my life. I mean, uh, I had a friend that was, you know, kind of joking with me as I was going over the, about to go over the waterfall and I was holding on to the zip line as hard, hard as I could. And he was like, Thomas, say something profound. And I was like, I was just speechless. I couldn't, couldn't say anything. I was too, too nervous. I was like, <laughs> I got to make it to the other side. But moments like that, make you think, hey, I'm glad I have a life insurance policy. <laughs> I'm glad I got a trust. I got a general durable power of attorney. I got an advanced directive. So I'm good. I got everything that I need if everything goes south. <laughs> Isn't being a lawyer fun? I mean, it just takes yes. everything out here in the in the moment. I'm sitting there going, well, at least my state planning is up to date and I'm and I'm good to go yeah. so to speak oh my goodness yeah That's we hilarious. had a guy on uh, that went with us that said i'm you know i'm glad i filled out that life insurance application before i came <laughs> so i didn't didn't have to say i've ever gone zip lining <laughs> <laughs> it's all about timing it's all about right. timing no no That's kidding right. well I, i'm really glad to hear you had a great trip and obviously it's great that we are seeing you live on the other side of, of that experience. And, uh, you know, it, it, some of those things are just so amazing because of the, the faith component it takes to, you know, strap yourself to that cable and trust that this is going to work out okay, you know, and it's just such a, yeah. a great kind of metaphor for life in terms of taking that step of faith and moving forward on, on things. So it sounds like you were able to, to be a blessing to those in Honduras and, a uh, great life experience for you as well. Yeah, thank you, Seth. It was definitely definitely a good time. Uh, well, tell everybody how they can reach you. Well, we're here in the heart of Hamilton County, right in uh, downtown Noblesville, Indiana, and that's our web address as well, noblesvilleattorney.com. How about yourself? 
And my name is Thomas Vick. You can find me at vicklaw.org. My practice is located in Greenwood, Indiana. So if uh, folks need an estate planning attorney on the north side of town, go see Seth. If you're on the south side of town, come see come see me. So uh, I appreciate it as always, Seth, and we'll talk to you next time. Sounds good, Thomas. Thanks.